Hello, welcome to the Curator Podcast. This is episode 11. Hi, hello, welcome once again, dear listener, to the Curator Podcast. I am your host, Mark Fraser, and this is episode 11. Thanks for tuning in. I just want to get something out of the way first. I'm now a member of ACAST. Now, ACAST is a podcast hosting company who have a couple of really cool apps for your iPhone or for your, your Android phone, and it's a really nice interface. It's the same kind of thing that Scrooby as Pip uses, and I'm really happy to be part of that family. Now, what that means for you is that you'll start hearing some adverts soon. But these adverts are just, you know, I guess I've spent a long time trying to explain this to myself and I did so in a blog post. So if you go over to the website, you'll see on the front page there's a blog post which is called A New Age Charitable Podcasting. But the long and short of it is I want to reach a bigger audience and ACAST can help me do that. I'm not interested in making money from the podcast. I still very much fall into the hobby podcast bracket, more for reasons of fun rather than through any kind of lack of drive. So I plan to give any money that I make to Macmillan Cancel Support. So if you want to know more, just uh, hit up the website or send me an email. I've been thinking about you recently, listener. Who's out there? What are you getting from this podcast? I want to share interesting shit with you. The kind of inspiring stories that make you want to be creative. But there's also the human aspect of creativity and how that affects people's lives, their personalities, their feelings and how that spills over any other aspects of their life and of who they are. Usually when I do an interview, I let a few days pass after it and then record this part that you're hearing just now. I like to take a few days to reflect on it. But the podcast that I recorded yesterday has left me feeling pretty amped up. So I thought I'd just let that spill over into this preamble. You see, we've gone deep this week, folks. We've went inception level deep. We're talking like fifth layer, some mind-bending shit. I sat down with the author, Ewan Morrison. He's responsible for books such as Swung, Tales from the Mall, and Close Your Eyes, amongst others. And we sat down and basically tried to get to the heart of what creativity is what individuality is, what that even means in this digital age and how, for a lot of people, creativity comes from a really dark place, a foreboding place. And as I sit and think about it, that occurs to me that for pretty much everyone that I've spoken to, that I've ever met that's creative, that creativity is catharsis, it's bloodletting, It's letting all your feelings, ideas, contradictions, philosophies, riddles, ideologies, hopes and fears explode onto the page or into a song or onto the canvas or into any piece of art. Creativity is, and every single individual, I think, connected. We all express it differently, and while we sure as hell don't think that all creative output that exists is worthy of our time, it all comes from the deepest, most fundamental parts of our soul. So when you sit down and you read a book and you don't think it's good or you listen to a band that you don't think is particularly to your taste, just remember that for that individual, that's coming from a very fundamental, deep part of who they are. And while you might not necessarily agree with the aesthetic way that that is delivered to you, you should at least, hopefully on some level, understand and appreciate the kind of effort they've went to to communicate that. I'm not going to say too much more because we cover it all in this podcast. Creativity, the internet, Facebook, Twitter, consumerism, politics, religion, music, community. And it is, as the Americans say, an absolute doozy. But first of all, Ewan's chosen a couple of songs and we're going to open with a song called Clearing by a band called Grouper. Enjoy. She's frozen again 
The elusive Ewan Morrison, you're now with us. How you doing? Not so elusive. Uh, well, I've, I've 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 been just playing hard to get, probably. But we've um, got our own story to tell here, I think. I <laughs> well, I'm, I have to apologise for being half asleep today for, for some very un unglamorous uh, jet lag um, coming back from the United States on purely personal, uh, you know, uh, mission. Nothing to do with work or anything. Um, but uh, yeah, I was just. Uh, there we go. I'm going to turn my phone off. Uh, just have to do that as well. Just recounting the odd experience there of, of being uh, being half asleep at six in the morning and experiencing a brass band in an airport at Reykjavik who were uh, welcoming back the uh, the Icelandic special needs Olympic team. So that was my that was my first experience today, <laughs> which is quite something, really. That sounds like a good breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> so like oh, a breakfast. You're the first author I've spoken to, and I'm a huge fan, so I just want to put that on record right now. Cool. <laughs> uh, as I said to you in our correspondence, I shall reiterate it, I guess. Uh, this podcast is all about passion and creativity. Yeah. So it's kind of trying to steer away from the whole, so what do you do for a living? Or tell me, sure. the, tell me your inspiration sort of shit. Do you know yeah, what I mean? yeah, yeah. So I guess I want to open with, when is the first time you vividly remember that you had to be creative? Well, this is an interesting one. I've since sort of psychoanalyzed this myself in that DIY sort of way. Um, when I was a kid, you know, because I hate these stories about like I've always wanted to be creative. Yeah. It just, it sucks. It's so middle class. It's so sort of like reach for your dream, reach for your goal. I always look at creativity kind of symptomatically. Mm -hmm. So I made art obsessively when I was a small kid because I was very disturbed as a small kid. Um, I didn't fit into the local community. Uh, I was horribly bullied, and and my my parents were just freaks. Who you know, well they were they were they were of a different ideology, a different background from the local community. It was a very small local parochial community. Yeah. Everyone knows everyone, and my parents come in as these fantastic hippie type people with uh, you know with their loud hailers and and their 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 open toe sandals and their long hair and their smelly friends uh, and so I was I was a pretty much a punch bag from day one um, and um, there was some kind of break there in communication between me and my parents that formed really early um, so I, anyway I, I look back now the first thing I did was I made uh, about 35 plasticine models of all the characters and asterisks and obliques wow. and then I did the same for Star Wars and then I just would make looking back I was making entire communities that I could uh, mold and destroy at will. I was okay. God. I was God, and these were all my little uh, characters who I could manipulate because I didn't have a community that I belonged in. So, there's a kind of dark haunting, I think, to the origins of of my creative impulse. Um, that's quite. I think that's quite common in a lot of people. I think they yeah. to come from a dark place. Yeah, well, I think sometimes we tend to put a put really like a positive spin on creativity and forget just the number of creative people who were either messed up or are messed up. There's that whole thing about, you know, the the uh, 28 year old musician, name one, anyone who's hugely successful and you'll find that they, they killed themselves or died of an overdose. Mm. I think with those people, they were going, well, the, <laughs> going. I was going to say going through, they terminated uh, at a point that I got through, but I could have been like that too. 
um, I think from an initial disturbance and the sense of non-belonging, that does impel certain individuals to being creative. In some ways, it's to try to just make the world a better place for themselves, or it's even a sense of revenge against the world. Usually you come a crop around about the age of 28, 30, on that first burst of, of largely negative energy. And if you manage to survive that, then you can have a, a more mature, more measured creativity. Which, you know, being a novelist uh, lends itself to that. But um, certainly within music and within the fine arts, there's a lot of people burn out around about 28, 30. But I'm pretty sure Kurt Cobain said this better to burn out and fade away. I think, yeah, he was probably quoting Neil Young. <laughs> probably quoting everybody. He quoted everybody. That's, that's the, yeah. the, great myth, the, the great mythos of Kurt Cobain was destroyed, I think, in Montage Effect. I don't know if you've seen it, the film, but yeah, it's kind of, he always wanted to be famous. He wasn't really this tortured genius. It was just... Oh, that's horrible. I hate that idea. I think that was more true for Courtney. For Courtney. Um, yeah. She started off such a phony. And you see early footage of her. She's like this little sort of um, new romantic goth wannabe um, but you know I saw her playing a couple of uh, was, it was last year and she's a great example of someone who's faked it till they made it you know yeah, absolutely, yeah. She's, she's now authentic after being a fake for so long yeah, she's authentic by circumstance though, yeah yeah well well, she's <laughs> she's been through the ringer you know yeah. uh, and, and I feel she is and here and, we are <laughs> well anyone who can who can sing like she does with that amount of plastic surgeries you know uh, is doing well in my book <laughs> so I guess I've been reading a bit about, a bit about your biography because that's what I've got to do and I'm a fan, as I say. Um, you worked in TV and film first before you really started working in novels, is that right? Um, when, how did that happen? How did that come about? It was more just a sort of... Um, it came about through art school to start with, which is really which is really kind of an important bedrock of the whole artistic practice thing for me. So the film and TV was secondary. Glasgow School of Art in the in the early 90s was, was amazing, sort of hot bit hotbed of very talented people who had come up or come through rather you know a whole bunch of new ideas so we're throwing out all the old conventional stuff it was the birth of all the neo neo conceptual stuff so you had artists like Douglas Gordon Christine Borland Martin Boyce um, Dave Shrigley mm-hmm. as well it's quite an amazing little melting pot of folk. And I guess we were all kind of rejectionists, in a sense. We didn't want to do the old-fashioned stuff, you know. And we had a really mixed bag of pseudo-political beliefs that were behind it all, you know. We were deconstructing this and challenging that. And, you know, it's all hogwash in retrospect, but it formed a really kind of strong unity. Um, a unity that I didn't really feel I was uh, immensely glued into. It was uh, I was more into the ideas... Um, so I, I got spun off art school into into arts TV, and I used to work at STV, making arts arts programs, and um, it was a great kind of it was a great time, strangely enough, because there was a government re- uh, remit that all uh, independent broadcasters had to do like an, an hour of art television every week, unimaginable. Now, Absolutely, yeah. What happened was, uh, you know, ten years after I started that, um, the well, no, probably six years after actually the government decided to change the legislation so it was one hour mandatory arts slash sport. (laughs) And so the arts got dropped completely. But, you know, we were, it was nuts because we had a film crew set up for every Thursday and we had to do an hour of arts television. So we would look at who was coming and we go, oh, damn, damn, we can't do them, we can't do them, we did them last year. We, we, you know, we almost ran out of people in Scotland to do. So um, there'd be... I'd be like sitting in a meeting. I go, well, hold on, Sonic Youth are playing on on Wednesday. Can we can we shift it so I can go and interview Sonic Youth? Sure enough, uh, we had to get it out, and you know, so we did like a like a twenty minute special on Sonic Youth, and I got to, you know, interview my gods. <laughs> um, another one was was uh, was Ivor Cutler. Um, I got to spend a whole day in the company of Ivor Cutler with a tiny little skeletal crew from 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 Glasgow. No commissioning process to go through. No wait. No pitch. We just had to film on a Thursday. Uh, so um, that was extraordinary. It's a bit that cavalier, isn't it? <laughs> it's totally cavalier, but it's the way to get stuff done. Yeah. You know, uh, looking at the way you'd get a half-hour programme with Ivor Cutler commissioned with the BBC, it would have been uh, six to nine months of of 
pitching and going up the levels and then getting it signed off down in London or whatever. But we just we just had to do it and we did it and it was odd and extraordinary and we managed to get Ivor Cutler to interview himself through the tricks of television and all the rest of it. So, so that was great, you know, that and that lasted for about four or five years. And then I started making my own uh, wee short films and then I got into to script writing and I got a gig um, over in New York which was uh, to write a script for a film. The film never happened but it, it got me into the daily routine of, of actually sitting and writing and via, I guess, quite a long detour uh, I ended up just concentrating on the writing. It sounds kind of interesting that you kind of spun off from that kind of one community in the art school and went into a whole other uncharted area of art, artistic insanity almost, like at the time you could say it sounds like, and it's like an art community entirely, but you still kind of went there. You just said earlier on that you used to spend time destroying the communities you made. <laughs> yeah, I'm still not very good at actually being within communities. Um, I want to, and at the same time I find them kind of a bit suffocating. Um, but I do miss the sort of the days when when um, when groups of artists would band together with a little bit more than self interest uh, motivating them. So, you think that's quite so, common now? I think that is common now because we haven't really got cultural movements in the same way that we used to. You know, I look back on my childhood. We had we had punk, we had we had ska, we had we had reggae, we had all these sort of factions. Um, and you, and you know goth whatever. If you were goth, you'd never speak to to someone who was into reggae. Um, if you'd uh, if you're a punk, you'd never speak to a hippie, whatever. Uh, but I think now in this multicultural tolerance that we have, you know, um, I think that's kind of just diluted culture. I know that sounds counterintuitive that a more confrontational, hostile, group led culture is better. But I actually think it leads to kind of greater cultural richness when when folk have got not just something that they love but something that they absolutely loathe as well another cultural group that they would have nothing to do with because you know you define yourself against as much as you just define yourself with um too much apathy almost like well i think i think strangely enough the contemporary apathy has come about by accident through people's good intentions you know, it's maybe a byproduct of pluralism and multiculturalism and just saying yes to everything, just being sort of positively embracing of diversity. Um, it's it's actually quite hard to have cultural debates these days as a result of that. Definitely, that's definitely mm. true. Everyone's was, just sort of into their own thing, yeah. you know, and like uh, when you ask someone like, why do you like that? They go, well, hey, back off, you know, like, I've got my own thing. Yeah, I hate that. Yeah. <laughs> I really fucking hate that. <laughs> yeah. You know, and you could all go to your... Your disco. What are these discos called where everyone's got their headphones on? A and silent they, disco. A silent yeah. disco. Well, on you go to your silent disco then if you're so into your own thing, you know? That's, well, that's interesting you mentioned that because I remember uh, I had a Scottish lecture at Glasgow Uni and you gave a lecture on Tales from the Mall. Right. And that was in that lecture. And I used to remember that we'd have that kind of, trying to have a cultural discussion in lectures and tutorials. Yeah. Contemporary, particularly with contemporary Scottish literature. Yeah. And uh, that was fascinating to me because suddenly people who maybe... I never really thought they'd had an opinion on stuff like that before. Suddenly did because they were forced to. Yes. But I, I guess the big dick in the chair, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, but mostly people are just like you say, they're sort of like, oh, well, you used to like that and that's fine. I don't have to like that either. I know, as if everything was just about whether you like it or not. Yeah. I think that's a lot to do with the internet as well, with liking and, you know, clicking and sharing and all this kind of stuff. And also the fact that we put on a positive spin of what we'd like people to think that we like. Um, is really very different from 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 the 1990s before the internet took over. Really, there's still a lot of that poserism, I guess, and hipsters and fakeness in the 90s as well. It just wasn't so. It was just it so was much more. more it somehow seems more vacuous, even though it's always been vacuous. It seems more vacuous now. <laughs> I, I think the main thing was that was was the factional thing. You know, I think you. I think we had a very uh, say. For example, I was in the sort of grunge industrial sort of look and sound and feel and everything. We were fairly obsessive about that kind of music. Um, and that that was good for a kind of cohesion. And we could sort of argue our corner on that one. Uh, and it was it was really anti-consumerist as well. Not that we ended up doing anything sort of hugely political. Again, it was more just a kind of culture of rejectionism. Uh, and that was just a kind of... That became, I suppose, hipsterism, mm. where you're kind of seen to be in... 
rejecting something. I, I mean, I suppose that the problem with my generation was all we managed to achieve politically was was the creation of ironic T-shirts. You know, <laughs> that was our, our our great fuck you and to after. consumerism <laughs> and after. <laughs> yeah, I know. So many good things are created. Uh, so many so many bad things are created by those people with good intentions. <laughs> Um, we ended up, we ended up uh, with our culture of rejectionism sort of undoing the the music industry by yeah. accident, really. I've yeah. been thinking about that a lot recently. We're now in that, we're kind of went from one shift of rejecting, of kind of like having this new format to now having even more problems born out of that, we, you know, with yeah. Freeman and all that. Like, it's just, anyway, that's getting off the point. Um, <laughs> sure, no, but I really do feel for musicians, filmmakers today who just can't make any revenue and who, who could have been just so good if they could have managed to turn their practice into something beyond a hobby. It's harder now than it's ever been. It really yeah. is, just because we've come to expect stuff for nothing, you know. David for, David Byrne actually had an article in the New York Times on Sunday. Yeah. Talking about... Oh, um, recently? Yeah. Talk, so he's been at it again. Yeah. He was, yeah. Talking about opening music black, music's black box, streaming's black box. He wants more transparency so people know what's happening because yeah. he talk he goes through this massive thing about how he owns his he he owns like half his own records because he's got his own record label. So mm-hmm. he asked his record publishing company to let him know how much money he was making. Yeah. And, and the publishing company was like, Well, see if you contact our lawyers, maybe then we can have that discussion. And he was like, Wow, well, this music, so what's going on here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> the same that's pretty much a similar thing to what goes on with Amazon as well. They they don't have transparency on their accounts. Yeah. They don't need to anymore because everybody's just buying, 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 and they, yeah. they don't ask questions anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this kind of leads me to asking about Tales from the Mall, which I, I sure. promised I wasn't going to do, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I suppose it seems worthwhile bringing it up now. Um, a lot of Tales from the Mall, when I read it, was all about this. Well, to me, spoke spoke to me about this idea of I, like try to forge your own individual identity and how it doesn't exist. That's a really good analysis. Um, it, it can't exist and you, you, I guess the, but then you've also got this sort of dichotomy of different communities and cultures uh-huh. so for example you said you're a part of this grunge industrial culture yeah you're a part of a community but you're also trying to f- sort of grab your own identity within that community which mm. still happens but now it's much more fragmented but also ironically paradoxically a lot more homo- homogenised now yeah. like people yeah. are just blending into one yeah you know and for me, when I read the book, I was kind of I thought to myself, "Well, this, mm. this speaks to this speaks to a society which kind of needs to hear this." You know. Well, I'm really pleased that you think that's the case because that's that's like the main engine of everything I do is that question of like how to, how to be an individual, given you know, and I like to to sort of position the complete opposite of that. What's it like to not be an individual? Just to wake up in one day and realize that everything you do. You know, allows you no human agency at all. You know, the job you do is to pay for the debts you have, the clothes you wear are of a certain kind because of certain fashion or whatever, or necessity or the wage bracket that you know that you've got, that you're in, that you're trapped in. Um, and I suppose a lot of the characters within Tales from the Mall are just waking up to the fact that they're having an epiphany about their own powerlessness, mm-hmm. uh, and that's something that we don't like to hear though I mean that's why it, it is a sort of uh, it's a fringy culty sort of book yeah. in as much as the mainstream culture is so much about positivity and believing in yourself counter to all the bloody evidence that shows you that you're barely an individual at all Not, none of us really are the kinds of individuals that we see advertised all over the place you know the, the great huge individuals the big egos we're mostly little kind of machine made drones with tiny amount of human subjectivity not much at all um, and that is driving us slowly mad I think because the promise of the culture is so out of odds with with um, with what we experience as our daily lives like that I mean you saying that about trying to position something outside of the community and seeing what it's like to not be an individual as well that kind of happens and close your eyes a little bit as well I think like um, with the main character on that as well it's all about she has no identity yeah, really, you know, she's just a vessel for whatever her upbringing was, you know, and that's well, that, kind of dark and deep. I like it. <laughs> yeah, but then close your eyes. That's really to do with this sort of hippie thing, and and it it, it takes another uh, level there because one of the goals of like hippie communities, communes, whatever, was to destroy individuality. Uh, Both two sides of the same coin. Yeah, 
I guess there's the one which is the kind of symptomatic destruction of individuality, which is like a byproduct of large economic systems, whether they be the Soviet bloc or whatever, or or late capitalism and it's kind of machine made stuff. Um, yeah, we don't have a strong sense of individuality there. I, I, I guess, I guess individuality has to be seen as a, like a little moment in history, which um, it's not had its day, but. I think it's quite hard for us to wake up to the fact that we're not. It's not really as good as we thought it was. Because we before, before, before this modern era, we, there was no such thing. Indeed, there was, there was no such thing. You know, I know we were you were people. You were born into well, you were born into like a caste system, a class system, and you know you, you didn't believe that if you believed in yourself more, you could be anything. You could be anyone. I mean, that's the great sort of American, sorry, American meritocratic lie, and it it does place the cosh on all of us it does put us under a lot of pressure you know am I being enough of an individual am I successful enough as an individual and you see it manifest in things like Facebook if you look at one person's Facebook profile they're struggling very hard to try to create a strong sense of individuality from all the fragments that they've got which are largely repostings of other things that are already in circulation and are already trending you step back from it and you look at 300 postings in a day and you'll see that everyone's doing exactly the same thing and there's barely any individuality in the process it, as you say it's a homogenizing process so we're getting more homogenized and at the same time we're buying in more and more to the ideal of a unique individuality and sadly we've been told this idea it's very sort of ayn rand sort of american libertarian thing you know which is powerfully bad stuff oh it's <laughs> potent and 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 hugely destructive um it's only by being a true, unique individual that you can be an economic success or have a life that's in any way meaningful. Um, so I guess I'm with the small guy in Tales from the Mall, or those who failed to to um, meet the threshold of being a unique individual. Um, I was there was a lot of stuff I was reading by a sociologist called Zygmunt Bowman, um, and that was behind a lot of the stuff in Tales from the Mall. And he he talks about the indignity. Of, of being someone with no choice in a culture based on the specter of choice. So so that's kind of, that's really what the characters were waking up to. Yeah. Kind of pickles my brain a little bit. I've read a few things, a few news stories, studies saying that once you're presented with lots of choice, yeah. the brain just collapses because it just can't. And you go for the mainstream yeah, option. Exactly. Every I've single got time. 700 <laughs> songs I've never heard of before, or I could just, oh, you know, maybe I'll just watch Taylor Swift instead. It would be yeah. much easier. It's a good explanation, really, as to why the internet has created these monolithic cultural slabs, you know, that we all gravitate towards. I mean, if you go 10, 15 years back, the internet was supposed to destroy the mainstream, you know, it was, it was, that's what a lot of the evangelism was about. You've know? never done that, 56k, never. <laughs> <laughs> Get off the phone! <laughs> aye, aye. So... This this idea of of the community and the individual, mm-hmm. where does that come from? That idea that from from what you were doing, you're growing up, or is it? Do you think that? You think it's something that you've just more or less? That, well, you obviously developed it over the time, but where do you think that genesis, that kernel of that idea, kind of was? There a moment that you can remember where you've kind of went? Yeah, well, I suppose growing up on. You know, as someone excluded from a community, I grew up in a very tight community, a town of 9,000 people, um, all sort of interwed and interbred and all the rest mm. of it. Um, so I always ha- ha- had a sense that the community was the most important thing and that I wasn't having it. And I guess through my 20s, I was l- trying to latch on to different kinds of community, whether that was the grunge, hardcore music scene or brief experiment with the sort of bondage, sadomasochist scene or later on with the swinging scene or whatever. They're all kind of community phenomena. Um, and I guess I've kind of moved through them. I, 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 but I have a hankering... I mean, and in Close Your Eyes, I went back to... to well, I went to Findhorn community and looked at a New Age community. I've heard <laughs> things about that place. <laughs> yeah, well, there's, there's, there's a lot of interesting authoritarianism going on beneath the... the uh, New Age phenomena. Um, I guess what I've, I guess what I've discovered through the whole process is that there may not be an answer to a dichotomy. You know, the individual and the community, one or the other, two sides of the dialectic, whatever. You may, 
I may have to, we may have to live with a kind of compromise rather than there being a, an answer. Because I've been within tight communities and I do find them too insular and kind of scary. Um, at the same time, I find the, the sort of free-floating individualism that we live with just now completely groundless and empty. Uh, and there is a hankering for some greater sense of belonging. So I guess, you know, personally, I sort of ping-pong between one and the other and, and realise, I guess, that I'll always long for a community but always be kind of a bit scared of being trapped within one. Mm. I, I don't think that's uncommon, really. I think if you've really thought about your place in the world and you're not more than just a drone who just, you know, inhales Facebook and exhales Twitter, like, <laughs> you know, like, I think once you've sat down and thought about it, I think anybody that does art rest, has wrestling with that yeah, or does wrestle with that, I think, if once they sit down and decide that it's a choice that they've wanted to go down, a path they've wanted to go down to make art. I think ultimately, in my opinion as well, all art is kind of foundational and based on that idea, um, which brings me to it, back to the writing, which we kind of touched on, and I want to come back to it a little bit. Is So you decided that you were going to be writing, you wanted to, you kind of went through the TV process and then you're, yeah. you become a novelist. Um, is that... It was through a book of short stories to start with, actually, yeah. yeah. So that, that became... That was like, that's it. That was you decided at that point, um, this, is what, this is what I'm doing now. This is, I'll just settle on that yeah, one. Just yeah, for that. not because there was any money in it or anything. It was just because it was immensely gratifying to be able to just write on a page and do a bit of editing and yeah, and uh, realise, hey, that's it, done. Now you've had your first novel turned into a film so, <laughs> that you wrote. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, well, that's it. That's a complicated process again because I guess I'm always trying to avoid the the processes of... of um, when there's, when there's many people involved and then there's like meetings and questions and can you change this and can you change that? That's, I mean, these are the kind of necessary compromises, but I guess the joy of writing comes from being able to sort of turn off from the idea of marketability and selling something uh, and just to sort of find out what happens when you unleash all the stuff that's in your head. Um, so so there's, a, there's a kind of primal joy, I suppose, to writing. Um, which is not which has not gone away. So, what was it like turning your book into a film? If I can ask, I don't know if you've been asked that yet. I don't know if you've but I, yeah. I felt as though I should ask it. Uh, well, swung was. Let me see. It went through very. It went through lots of different processes. So we had two different directors, the same production company. There was like dark swung. There was slightly light lighter swung. Swung light. There was all these kinds of versions that we went through to try to get a story basically a story that is pretty fringy about a couple of Gen Xers who reject everything, who end up um, just going to the limits of rejecting everything and, and being in a very marginal position uh, relative to lots of things, rejecting family, losing their jobs, ending up really um, on the cusp of being nobody at all uh, and losing the ability to even have sex together, you know, um, that was what spurred them on to enter the swinging community mm. and then find them, you know, themselves with a whole bunch of fringy and marginal types. So the whole question is, how do you get that across to a mainstream audience? Or, and that wasn't really something I was hugely passionate about doing because I'm a bit of a slacker, you know? Um, I don't, I'm not really crazy about all those kind of compromises. Um, but thankfully, there were so many other factors involved in doing it that that it didn't seem like it was compromised. Um, so, for example, uh, in the novel, we have an American female. She's a bit of a kind of Kim Gordon type, you know. She walks about with her underpants and ironic T-shirts on, considers herself a bit of a punk. And then we ended up uh, with Elena Anaya from the Almodovar movies uh, cast as the female lead. Completely different, so that had to be restructured. And just thinking about the whole practical way to get things done seemed a lot better than second guessing the market so I managed to struggle through it and we ended up with a movie that's quite different from the actual book but the premise is pretty much the same
to process anything like what you were doing back in the mid nineties when you were making those <laughs> making those crazy one hour arts things on Thursday nights. <laughs> well, I guess, I guess, I guess not really. And as much as you know, there are all these kind of. It's hard working with a large team and people chipping in their ideas sometimes I mean what really worked was it was just me and, and Colin in the end who, who who worked on the script together we didn't receive too many script notes or at least he was chal- he was channeling them um, so I didn't have to have the, the committee of 12 people telling you that you've got to change this word which is a common practice within within film production so I think Colin took uh, Colin Kennedy the director took the most of of that so I didn't have to deal with that um but I don't know if if uh, if we'll ever go back to the mad joy of hopping on a train down south to to hang out with Ivor Cutler for a day, uh, that was or Sonic Youth, or or Sonic Youth. Yeah, that was just a mad time when TV was 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 uh, trying to find its feet just before they they swept the arts departments away completely. It was all on YouTube, and it's just so of, it's just so much of it. It's just it's all gone. Yeah, well, it's I, all there somewhere. But it's all are you bored well. of the internet yet? I'm kind of bored of. I, of that infinite choice thing and and all these little vines and fragments. I can be more than on it. You can... It's part of my job. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not part of your brain, though. No. It's no, it's not. It's definitely not. I guess you can get more bored of some things than others. Like like uh, I've I've got really really bored of Facebook recently since it's got um, more and more personalised. So it's decided what I want, <laughs> and giving me what I want just bores me senseless. <laughs> You can't decide what I need. <laughs> no, you can't. I want to have some lectures from some right wingers today, and I want to <laughs> meet people who I don't like. Thank you very much. I think if we've, I think if we've met a lot of the people that we know on Facebook and Twitter, we probably wouldn't like them anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, you have these strange things where you meet a Twitter friend or a Facebook friend, and you go, "Hi, hi," and you realise you've got nothing in common, and yeah. nothing to say. You've had a fantasy and virtual relationship. That's why I took my. I had my school lessons on Facebook. Yeah, and I took it off because people from school tried to keep adding me, and I was like, "Like, I don't give a fuck about what you're doing in your life," and I, like, stop trying to talk to me. We didn't talk in school. What the fuck do you want? Well, you know the, <laughs> the the horrible reason why they do that though. It's that you know, it's that line by um, um, Gore Vidal. You know, um, you know, to paraphrase it, um, you know, th- there's nothing that makes me feel worse than seeing the success of a friend. So. Um, Basically, your friends on Facebook are just checking in to make sure that you're a failure. <laughs> that you're more of a failure than they are. And they'll do it in this passive-aggressive way. You go, hi, how you doing? Da, 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 da. You know, oh, you haven't got kids. And then they start, you know, uh, twisting the knife with you. It's, it's pretty malignant, really. Yes, I think that's obviously a massive ego boost as well, or it can be a bit of a crusher as well. <laughs> yeah, well, in fact, when we don't feel that we've got much, the way of human agency and freedom, sadly, what we do is we look for those we know to see if they're suffering more than we are. And that gives us a little temporary pickup. Facebook is really good at doing that, it would seem. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> a lot of people. It seems that's what was. <laughs> well, you know, possibly it was actually designed with that in mind, you know, because Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg was, was an excluded guy who might have had a bit of resentment going through him as well. I, I still like I still see resentment in his face when I look at him. Maybe I'm just imagining it there. <laughs> Behind that, like, that smile, yeah, that, yeah. that smile, that, that, that perpetual that grin, vacant eyes. Like, mm. like yeah. well, at least when you see Steve Jobs, you knew that guy had resentment. He just had that face, yeah. you know. Aye, aye. No, there's like Zuckerberg's got the dead eyes of a shark. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> Someone from Harvard, for definite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I spoke to a lot of musicians, and thus far, <laughs> it's been all musicians so far, and. Uh, who like even when they've got an album out, we've kind of touched on this a little bit. When they've yeah. got an album out on a respectable level, they've toured a lot and stuff like that. They still need to go home and take job, take jobs. Yeah. And we were kind of speaking a little bit about this before we started recording. Uh, do you think the internet has played a large part on on the same kind of process for writers as in not being able to make a living from, not being able to make a living from yeah their trade or their craft? Mm, it's a lo- it's a long one to answer because uh, well I've been working through this for years I've, d- I've eventually decided to s- shut up on it after writing a- quite a lot of articles in The Guardian because people just tend to think I'm whinging or that I'm just talking about me not being able to make as much money as I used to to get by um, it's 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 an economic model that we're in just now which is very specific it's not personal it affects us all um, we've, we've seen a real 
shrinkage of the mainstream in terms of what's accessible within the mainstream and what really seemed like in the music industry the falling away and the dying of all the uh, all the indie labels there's a few fringy ones which managed to keep going but there was a proliferation of of indie well indie filmmakers indie production companies indie uh, musicians and music labels all that that whole indie fringing into mainstream thing has kind of died away we're more now in the, in the economic model of what they call the long tail um so you have a sort of peak which is your mainstream stuff it's your it's your it's your well-known writers it's your it's your your crime writers or your your, your 50 shades whatever and there's a, a real drop off in in terms of book sales from the you know from the millions to the thousands and we're seeing, you know, people like Will Self talk about this openly now. You know, he says, like, I've been nominated for the Booker Prize and I sold 700 books with my last thing. And James Kelman talks about it as well. Um, I remember James Kelman talking about it. He was still a school teacher. Yeah. You know, and it's like, yeah. you, you won the Booker Prize, man. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's shocking, really. Um, I guess the problem is that the way the economic model works now is the books that are bought in bulk are really they're heavily advertised they're heavily mainstream and they're dirt cheap as well they're like 2 dollars 3 dollars in the supermarket shelves those are the things that the public really want to read literary fiction has become a really niche market you know a bit like uh, a bit like post rock or you know neo folk yeah. or something in in the musical world it used to be like the mainstay and we used to think of, of literary fiction as one of the pillars of society and now it's, it's you know, or at least of democracy. But now it, it really is just a niche market, one that's shrinking at quite a speed. It's um, interesting because, like, for me, I just kind of seen that as it was exploding, given that I'm, I'm 30 this year. I yeah. Don't know, kinda, I was starting to, I guess, become properly conscious, I suppose, in the early 2000s. And then, yeah. But you've you've kind of lived through that, like, from, from the whole proliferation of indie, uh, indie everything. Yeah. You can make a living from doing that to now been in a point where you can be indie but indie definitely does mean independent you are on your own and that's it <laughs> you're on your own you have to self sell self promote and also you're you're all, you're all competing with each other now as well you know if you look at people who are self publishing they they just bring their prices down bring their prices down they take it to zero um what are they in that for if they're not enough for money you know like yeah, that that well that whole thing for me starts to become a lot i'm going to bring down the price of my book until it's like a penny and yeah. just hope people buy and read it and then Okay, that's cool. Well, it's kind of desperation, but it, yeah. it benefits the company that puts it out there, that creates the, the platform. So three million failed writers earning £10 a year, still massive profits for the company. Let's just, just name them. Let's call them Amazon. <laughs> um, there are other platforms too, but they make money on other people's failure, basically. And we're just seeing that now after so much spin and hype about, you know, going it alone on the internet and being a self-publishing success and all the rest of it. The truth is, it's a bit like, you know, there was a long tail in music, a long tail in blogging. I think people have forgotten already because they don't like to remember that there was once a promise that you could you could make a living being a, a blogger. That one lasted as a myth for, for, you know, a good five years or so. It's now it's vanished. Now the, yeah. the data and the evidence is just hidden because everyone who failed at it doesn't want to tell everyone, well, I failed. It was structural. Um, uh, thousands of other people failed doing it as well. So we just we just ride on now with that failure concealed, and it's kind of the same with the whole self publishing thing in um, in writing. And also, what's making it worse and harder for for writers is is the whole thing about advances, writers' advances um, being shrunk. They're now about ninety percent ninety percent smaller than they were ten years ago, which just means that. Chaps like me have to have to make a living elsewhere, um, so I, you know, I work in film and TV still. I've gone back to that, um, and uh, it's but you know my artistic output has slowed down over the last over the last three or four years. You know, just because there's not there's not a simple way to make a living as a writer anymore. It's not a simple way to I think anything creative and and, and get I guess what you, see it. I have an interesting. I have a very interesting kind of cognitive dissonance in my head about this. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that being an artist, at the end of the day, is the most selfish thing you could do. Right. And apart it's, from being a Buddhist. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's the most self 
fulfilling thing. It's the most self-aggrandizing thing you could possibly do. But at the same sense, you're kind of wrestling with your own ego because you feel as you've got to get something out and you get it out, which is great. This is awesome. Yeah. If you want people to read it, which ultimately means some kind of compromise at some word in the line if, if you want to get m- like real money from doing it. So I think now that cognitive dissonance is probably much more pronounced than it ever has been. Does that make sense? It does, although I would draw a line, a very hard line between um, certain art practices and and the ones that do actually provide sustainable livings for for their practitioners. Uh, fine art, fine art is any anything that can't be reproduced, anything that still clings to the feudal medieval idea of uh, a single object. You know, whether I sell that teacup in front of me, you know, or I do a painting or a sculpture, or whatever. There's one of them, or there's an addition of five, or an addition of ten. These guys are still doing well because they're not touched by the internet. There's no way that these irreplaceable um, objects can be can be supplanted by the internet. Can't be copied, or can't be yeah. copied because mm-hmm. the whole thing rests on the idea of the authentic individual. I mean, in a way, it's really backward, and it's it's us fetishizing um, authentic objects. But uh, in terms of art practice, if you know, across the board, if you wanted to to be able to sustain, have a sustainable living as an artist, fine art would be the place to do it. I do know a couple. I do know one guy that did do fine art, Glasgow School of Art, and uh, he he went back to Belfast after he'd done it, and he's a great artist. Mm. He's he's wonderful, and now he's just playing in a band again. It's, I guess it's also hard to make up and doing that. I suppose <laughs> if you've got to be really really fucking good at doing that. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I would not go near the music industry if I was a creative person. It would it just have to be a hobby, really. Yeah, well, I, I, I would always call myself a hobbyist in, in everything creative that I do. <laughs> I think it's much easier than the ego if you do that. <laughs> well, yeah, no, sometimes I think, oh, God, I'm a nine-to-five hobbyist, you know? Uh, have you... I guess I should probably ask you this, and have you ever been, like, a full-time... Would you call yourself a full-time writer? Um, well, let me see. I started being a full-time writer in 2003, mm-hmm. and that sort of tailed off again probably about two years ago. So there was a good sort of decade in which I was I was just living off writing because I mean that would also involve a bit of journalism as well. Um, the first person I spoke to this kind of being in that position, I guess. And yeah. Any kind of task position mm-hmm. has, has that been? How difficult was that to take when you realised that everything's not going the way it used to? Well, it's it's just a paradigm and a generation thing, you know. The people who I used to be published by, even at Random House. Random House has become Random House Penguin. They had massive layoffs across the board. The people who were my editors and who I work with um, are no longer are no longer there, or they're in a very much diminished capacity. Um, it's just one of these generational things. I've seen it happen throughout my creative life. I saw it happen in in television when they decided that they didn't want arts coverage anymore. It had become arts and sport. I guess I'm just used to these waves of creative destruction, you know, that 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 sweep through the industries that I work in. I do call them industries. I know people have got eerie fairy ideas about, you know, art. Somehow it's not an industry and we all do it for the love of it. But I'm very much a believer that artists should be able to, learn, you know, earn a living from what they do. Otherwise, as you say, we're just all hobbyists. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I'm, 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 a, I'm a bit weary now after so many waves of creative destruction. I think had I been a musician at some point, I would have thrown in the towel just because it's been demonetized so much, you know, it's a half the industry globally is half the size it was ten years ago. Um, we're seeing shrinkage in the book thing. I'd like to quite substantial shrinkage, like Random House Penguin. Uh, its revenues were down twelve percent in the last quarter. That's a global, you know, multinational down by twelve percent. That's that's really on the skids. Um, I'd almost like to w- go to sleep and wake up in ten years' time and see what the publishing industry looks like then because at the moment everyone's just sort of second guessing it's definitely going through a period of turmoil a bit like the music industry is and there are going to be a lot more casualties I think Um, I think folk who can't make a living in another field and sort of have transferable skills um, are going to really suffer or throw in the towel Do you think having the ambition to do that in any kind of art form is, is fully now? Folly. Um, I th- well, we have to remember that the idea of like being a success and being a star, how much of that is actually caught up 
with all of the bullshit propaganda that we receive. You know, we can't all be Taylor Swift. We can't all be Katy Perry. And let's just remember that most of these people, you know, think of Britney or whatever, they were manufactured to start with by, by media conglomerates. You know, she was a Disney child baby. Um, we we have to look more critically, I think, at the people who we worship and adore and, 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 and see uh, just how, how kind of fake that all is. So at the end of the day, I just come back to the enjoyment and fulfilment of of the simple task of writing, and I can't fix the industry, so I just have to. I guess like indie musicians did, you know, in the late nineties, early two thousands, they just thought, you know what, we can't fix the industry. Do we just keep going ourselves, doing our own thing, or you know, or do we become media analysts? One of it's. <laughs> One of the strangest things I came across recently, there was a guy called John Fine who was in a band called Bitch Magnet. Oh, was, yeah. He just yeah. released a book recently. Yeah, he yeah. did. Yeah, Your Band Sucks, yeah. it's called. <laughs> it's a kind of history of of, um, of the of the post-rock grunge indie thing. Um, I'm going to read it. It's, it's, it's on my reading list. Um, he's actually become a media analyst, right, yeah, for, for Business yeah. Week uh-huh. or something. So he had this massive turnaround. His stuff was really out there as a musician, you know? Um couple of people that's happened to like yeah. in bands like I know as well they've just become writers for Vice or something like that because you know yeah <laughs> I can't make a living in a band or being out so oh, but then you need to ask is that still is that really writing you know <laughs> well no it might just actually be scrabbling together what skills you've got left in a in a very disposable labour market see that's one of the things that I, I think quite disturbing in general just about late capitalism is the fact that we you know the job for life is clearly out the window um, so we we just go from one one job that's as long as we can manage to stretch the contract out to to the next one to the next one. Or it's, the, it's this, yeah, it's this whole thing about you know at some point your energy is just gonna get burned out. You become that guy in the call center at like forty five, like oh, that's it. Yeah, I'm stuck here now. I I live on caffeine and nicotine. And I can't keep going any longer. That that kind of thing. We've we, you know we live in a time where where we have disposable labor. The funny thing is, the funny thing I find with young writers is they would be absolutely mortified at thinking that this might be their own future. They are in absolute denial about that. And and they might look at, at, at older people, at older writers who were once famous, and they might think, oh, great, that's, that's, uh, that's them out the way. You know, that's more space for me. And they're, they're getting the wrong lesson from it. The lesson is that, yeah, you can get to the top and you can fall. Mm-hmm. And, and then you can do it again and again and eventually you're going to have no energy left um, it's a very aggressive business model a, a very ag- aggressive view of the arts you know the the sovereign struggling individual who gets there again and again on the strength of their convictions it's 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 unnecessary in many ways um, I look back at other forms that artistic expression has been in you know the artisan the craftsperson what would it be like to get more respect the longer you did something you know we used to have this uh, through the 60s 70s 80s with filmmakers you know you would they would their budgets would go up and up they would make more ambitious films you get this with, with Fellini uh, Tarkovsky Bergman and these classics of cinema you thought yeah hold on they're uh, they're 50 now you know They've gained seniority, such and such. I think we're we're losing a sense of that now. Um, there's a lot of focus on the you know the startup, you know the brand new kid on the block, whatever. And I've seen it's amazingly, it's amazing how fast a, someone who's new can become immediately successful and then completely drop off the scale. It's usually the second novel mm-hmm. after the first one. I've seen a lot of people come and go. And I don't know what they do now, but you know they had the huge advances and all the publicity and all the PR, and um, the second book didn't sell, and they're they're just they've gone now. You know? Seems that sort of rabid idolization of people, because we love to see love to see our, our heroes succeed, but we also love to watch them crumble and fall. And we do. We we really vanish into We're really and encouraged things. to do that yeah. though as well. It's even worse now in, the, in in our in our age. Like we love to see every single detail of someone's disastrous collapse yeah there was some some article in the in the in the new yorker about this um the guy came up with the concept of uh, a fail edit so it's it's basically these these uh these kind of vine or 
YouTube compilations of all the worst moments oh, yeah. uh-huh. in yeah. your life put together. <laughs> so this is now waiting for us. We don't get to go out silently. We go out with every humiliation we've ever had edited together onto uh, you know a single track, and and you know so folk can gloat. I just had this really our destruction insane vision of people playing them off your nose like <laughs> <laughs> the worst <laughs> you, you would never know <laughs> <laughs> all the people you've shot on are there to watch you as well they get it right up you yeah how you know you're dead I've got all this failure this glorious failure <laughs> it is horrible I mean I see them you know in the media it's this ruthless new media like things like the Huffington Post which don't even pay if you if you blog for them you know yeah I was reading about that recently that's just they oh, offer you, uh, you know, a free platform. A friend of mine... It's a factory floor. That is, that is, that is like a factory. It's exactly like a factory. Yeah. 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 A friend of mine, um, he's a really good uh, kind of cutting-edge journalist guy called Dale Lately. Um, he uh, he sent me this stuff about, um, you know, the way that that system works. So basically, if you're going to blog for them, they'll give you like a list of trending subjects that you can blog for. And like, you're only expected to do like two or three hundred words on each piece and you get paid a pittance for doing absolute tiny amounts if you do your own blog you get paid nothing at all you they'll, get a byline but they'll host it yeah <laughs> they'll host it for you it's it's all this kind of free labour on the promise that you'll be able to build a platform it's classic sort of trick economics like you're being tricked into the idea of like if you if you believe in yourself enough you'll be a success but there's so many people just struggling to do that and it's precisely because no one admits they've failed that the system manages to keep duplicating itself. So once, once you know, the people who started um, blogging and vlogging for free in the start of 2015, once they're burned out, you know, they'll just go quietly. They won't post a blog about how the whole system's meant to exploit you. So in the second half of 2015, you get the new guys coming in and going, yeah, 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 we can do it. And they'll be burned up by 2016. So... Uh, yeah, we need to pull the plug on that thing. Yeah, it's a consequence of the American dream, I think. We can rampant consumerism is just like it's all about that. We only want we all want value in what we consume in our content. But it's so transient now that it's just it's pitiful, I think. It's yeah. Well it, you know, also we're consuming more and more just mainstream crap as well. Um it's the kind of default setting of there being too much content. As you said, there's just too much available. I mean, how many times have I been tempted to look at um, some information about Kim Kardashian. I would never, ten years ago, have even known that she existed. You know, now it's on every feed that I get. It's on my Gmail. It's on my sorry, not my Gmail, uh, my Yahoo Mail. Um, I get like um, adverts and banners on YouTube, and all all the rest of it. You know, and they call them feeds as well, which is something really <laughs> tube feed. Yeah, there's something <laughs> sick about For, that. Forced feeding. <laughs> anyway, I think I think you can follow call it. Call it there. Uh, that, that was an awesome chat, Ian. Thank you very much. Cool. Is there anything you want? You. Uh, I guess before I, I say the next thing, I was going to say, what are you working on now? <laughs> right. Well, um, I have a, a book which will be out in 2017, uh, which is about the an economic collapse, or rather, someone who thinks that there's going to be a global economic collapse, and he's um, he's a survivalist. Or he's, been, he's been planning for it. He's also, unfortunately, divorced. So he's got to he's got to abduct his own children. Um, that's a story told from the perspective of his teenage daughter. So it's the same themes. Usually, I'm stuck within a very small parameter of of what my themes are. Like how to be an individual in consumerism. Well, here we've got a potential economic collapse and people uh, quite happily actually trying to construct lives from from very little. Um, there's that, and I'm also working on a. Uh, a story about a story about bullying, actually bullying and cyberbullying, and uh, bullicide, which is kids who kill themselves after being bullied, oh. and bully revenge, which takes on board things like Columbine. Um, it's a very dark book, and I'm writing that from the inside of someone who ends up killing a lot of people. That sounds important, though. Yeah, um, well, you know, it's a big subject, um, and one which. Michelle and President Obama are very concerned with they keep channeling money into the whole bullying thing mm-hmm. and the cyber bullying thing at the same time of course they're 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 allowing the, you know the internet to spread like a virus through our lives <laughs> so they're they're kind of taking away with one hand what they give with the other um, 
No, but I think it's um it's been quite a while in coming this book. I've been I've been mulling over a lot of the the information, uh, trying to keep up to date on on bullying, trolling, and and all the new techniques. It's dark. It's it is, it's horrendously dark stuff. Who knows if anyone wants to know? I see. This is one of the problems I face all the time. Is is I think I, this is really important to me. You know, and th- this subject matter is important, but I'm generally sort of turning over stones and looking at, at the way things don't work or what false ideas we have or whatever. I do that out of a sense of probably compassion or something, but um, I really do think that the world really doesn't want to know that it's as messed up as as it is. I think we're I think we've we've bought into the idea of personal salvation through positivity to such a degree that we we like to pretend everything's okay even when it's not. Yeah, I think and if you don't if you don't pay attention to that, to your to you doing that to yourself, it's very easy to go to get caught up in it. Yeah, yeah. Well you're under peer pressure to like it's like, you know, a bunch of teens or whatever, they all just they congregate together and they all tell each other that everything in their world is great and it's fine and it's ex- they're becoming like their own Facebook feeds. It always comes back to the word feed. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else you want to say before we finish or anything you want to ask me? I, well, yeah, where are you with the whole community thing? What do you think about community? Is it possible? Well, it's the first time someone's actually asked me a question when I've asked that. <laughs> <laughs> Usually everyone's like, no, it's okay. Um, there's two, two ways I can look at it, right? The writer in me, half has studied Scottish literature and realised... A lot of Scottish literature is about community. Mm. Um, I do think community is a thing, but I, I don't think I think there are a lot more, a lot more modular uh-huh. than they've ever been. Um, I'm just thinking about community and train spotting. That's so the case. I yeah. mean, that's it's not like a community which is is based on any principles. It, it's like a community based on location. They all come from the same places. They take the same drugs, whatever. But they've got commitment to each other. Yeah. Oh, fuck it. I'm going to say it. I, I was. I was. I've, <laughs> I've had this thought for a long time, and I've been going to alienate a lot of people that I know. But I'm going to fucking say it anyway. <laughs> I'm quite active in the music community with a lot of people that I know, and the punk in me, because I I'm a punk. I like this idea of community that we had. In the seventies and seventy seven, but that came from a time before Thatcher, before yeah. the demolition of industry. The days when you could leave your door unlocked and you'd have an actual community, mm-hmm. and a hardcore community in the eighties in America was also the same kind of thing. It was mm-hmm. like we all love each other, we all band together because we're one against all. Mm-hmm. If we do that, we're all attracted to this idea of community, but we can't do it because we still have this. Cliqueiness. We still have like just people we don't like. We still hold resent. We still hold grudges. We still resent people that we see as more successful than us. Mm-hmm. We like the illusion of community. We like the fact that we like to think we have a community or that we're part of a community. We like to think our community is inclusive, but it's not. Mm-hmm. And people need to. I think people need to realise that. People need to talk about that because it's quite a destructive thing. It's fine. It's all fine and well saying we are a community, and if you like this, you can come to our shows and we'll put on. But I've been in enough bands and I've known enough people and I've spoken to enough people that it's like, well, why? if they're in such a community, then why won't that guy book my band? What's he got against me? What's he got against my band? People talk shit behind each other's back. So we like the idea of community and yeah. at the very core of who I am, I'm an anarchist. I think community is the way it should be. I'm mm-hmm. very idealistic in that sense. But I think that so much has changed over the years that the way that our society has eroded our sense of what community actually is and can yeah. be. Mm-hmm. And... I love the idea of it, but I'm sick of grasping for it and it not being there. That's dead interesting. I've seen this happen with with um, with uh, what was it called when writers read publicly? You know, you get like a like a sort of group of people who who like perform. Yeah, it's like r- writer reading events. Mm-hmm. Um, they pop up and some of them, and, yeah. and a little community yeah. builds around them. And then as soon as one writer becomes successful or gets a deal, the whole thing collapses just because of resentment and, and envy. And, and the same thing happens with with, um, with the poetry. And, but maybe poetry communities last a little longer because the idea of success in poetry is always elusive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, I guess it probably could be the same in music as well. Um, 
in as much as people group together at the start when they're all starting out and they're all helping each other but all it takes sadly is not systemic failure that breaks people up it's the success of one person or even just like fucking somebody else's girlfriend like yeah it that, can be it can, can be that be anything like yeah, that as well, be, you know well, like, that's the problem with these little communities yeah. of, of interest is that they are uh-huh. terribly incestuous and yeah. they do swap over um, not to get us out clearing the community I don't think and it would be good yeah. if we could have them and we spend a lot of time online. We've kind of just briefly talked about it, I guess. We spend a lot of time online thinking we're part of big communities and yeah. we feel like we are. Yeah. But it takes it just takes one day mm-hmm. or even like half an hour, you know, and you can break that link and then it feels like you're on the outside. And people don't like to feel like they're on the outside. People like to feel like they're in communities, but we're always all on the outside of the communities because it's never like, it's never how we think it is. Well, I mean, if you think about the the internet going down for a week, given that the internet didn't exist before 1993, I think we'd really would have a, um, a matrix type experience of waking up in the eggshell and realizing that we're plugged in lots of wires. Mm-hmm. I think we we would find actually that a lot of our community ideas and our political ideas are entirely virtual, entirely mm-hmm. fictional. All those things we clicked on to support whatever we can't do that anymore okay so how do i support this political cause well you have to do something rather yeah. than just click and um a lot of our a lot of our community affiliations and even friendships you know are are, are now dependent on this this virtual stimulus and exchange you know we would we'd actually have to go and see each other more if there was no internet it's just a good thought experiment i think because it ain't going to happen anytime soon unless we have some kind of global catastrophe yeah. that takes the internet down. But, you know, maybe, you know, I've been drawn more and more in the absence of, of community. I've been drawn more and more to the idea of cults. You know, cults get a bad name. They often end in death. <laughs> you know, the Jim Jones, Jonestown type cult. Drinking uh, the red Kool-Aid and all that. The Kool-Aid, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that was a weird, perverse hybrid of, of pure Marxism and and uh, religion mm-hmm. that led to that. Fascinating. But, I mean, as a, again, as a thought experiment or as a work of fiction, I've been trying to create, actually, a utopian community in writing for quite a, a period of time. It'll be the one thing that I never get finished and they'll find a box full of the stuff when I'm dead. Um, but every time I try to create one, it always gets messed up because you can't, actually bring who we are as people now into this kind of blank slate idea of, of a community. We always bring in the ingredients that are going to trash it. You it's know? almost like we've, it's kind of in a weird way, it's almost kind of like we have, we've parts of us, parts of society, parts of who we are as individuals, it seems to have entered into that Hobbesian state of nature. Yeah, for o- sure. Automatically now. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is terrifying to me. As someone that is basically anarchist, that's terrifying to me, do you know what I mean? But like you say, as soon as you bring personalities in and and how people get twisted up by the the constraints and the the way our society is, you know, it I just mean, messes you, us up. <laughs> I mean, in many ways, there's things to be learned from things like religious communities. Um, and religious communities start from a good premise sometimes, which is that we are flawed and and screwed up. I'm going to hurt each other. And like, if you, even it's funny because the you know. Only recently have I worked out the way that Christianity works because it because it does work um, for a vast number of people. I don't believe in heaven or hell or any of that stuff, but the idea of paying homage to a guy who died died horrendously and the image of his suffering is a good foundation for for a community or or a, a set of convictions that that would help you live with others. It's really the opposite of the American dream yeah. type individualism. What the message of Christ on the cross is, I say as a non-Christian, mm-hmm. is that we're all going to die horribly and we're all in this together. Um, our individual lives don't really count for much. And that's, I think once you've accept, accepted that, that's a good way of being with other people. I think religion is, is good for that. I, I'm, I guess, I'm the same as yourself. don't believe in heaven, hell, none of that stuff. And having come from a Catholic upbringing and seen what my gran went through at the hands of the Catholic Church because she was a massive active member of that church and then when she, she got cancer and got ill, she couldn't, and she couldn't do the flowers on the altar anymore, having anybody came to see her, which yeah. is totally shit. Uh-uh. But all, all religion is good for creating that community though. You know, that I think that's ultimately 
That's probably what their evolutionary purpose is, and a lot of people will probably shoot me for saying that, but no, it's, it's, it's I think it's true. Mm. If you take away the you can have that God bit if you want, right? You fuck it. Like, so yeah. the, the Jew, Jews are really good at that. Like, they've got them, the Jewish communities, there's a lot of Jewish atheists out there, mm-hmm. but the, the sense of community is super strong. Mm-hmm. And it's, I think that's probably a good way of looking at it. It's like, well, I can still be culturally this. Yeah. I don't have to subscribe to all of it. And it still exists, if that makes sense. No, I think that makes perfect sense. I'm even thinking about the Frankfurt School, which is largely Jewish Marxist individuals. Uh, sort of intellectuals, uh, you know, there was a there was there was a common project there, not a religion, a very atheistic philosophy, um, but the idea of of having a common set of beliefs grounded in an understanding of human nature and a, a, a book, I guess, to for people to believe in might be the strongest foundation that you can have for a community. Um, we can do with we could do with creating that, I think, rather than being swept up in all this individualism that sets us against each other. I'd have to make that book a Twitter feed now, though. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be easily digestible. It's trending. Community's trending this week, folks. Oh, sorry, it's gone already. Okay. Ewan, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Well, that... That is what you call mind expanding. There's always something so enthralling about hearing a writer talk... And just to hear their thoughts unfold and overlap and explode into ideas and musings and questions. And sometimes it's contradictory, sometimes it's clear as day. But I think hearing those questions and vocalising them and starting a discussion is perhaps one of the most important things that we could ever do as human beings. And I hope this podcast does that too. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. If you could go on to iTunes and give me a rating and review, I'd really appreciate that. And as ever, you can follow me on social media. I'm quite active on Twitter, so get me on there. It's at the Curator Pod. Please take some time to check out Ewan's books. Go to a brick and mortar store for God's sake and buy them. They're great. All the links you will find in the show notes. I'm going to play you out now with a cracking track by the immortal, the legendary Swans, and this song is called "The Seer Returns." Until next time. Bye-bye.
Thanks for listening to this podcast, which is brought to you by Acast. Like you, millions of people enjoy podcasts every week. Acast works with thousands of amazing shows, reaching the most engaged, loyal and desirable audiences on demand. For more information about advertising, sponsorship and branded content opportunities for your business, contact us using sponsor at acast.com.